right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. Um, I'll go ahead and get us started. Let me just pull up my slides here. All right. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us um, this afternoon. Um, seeing lots of familiar faces in the uh, participant list and in the chat. Um, if you haven't already, go ahead and say hi and tell us where you're joining from. Um, and my name is Kate Schwanhauser, and I am the Special Events Manager here at Food and Water Watch. And I'm excited to welcome you all to today's event, um, A Bridge Fuel to Nowhere, Fighting Natural Gas Infrastructure. And we're really excited to be joined today by um, two of our Food and Water Watch organizers, Emily Skydell and Tomas Rebecki, as well as one of our incredible volunteers and community leaders, Mark Sanchez Potter. And we also have a special guest appearance um, from Jim Walsh today as well. Um, so we'll be talking today about a new research piece that Food and Water Watch just released about the harmful impacts of power plants on nearby communities. And we'll hear from our guest speakers about um, the important fights um, that are featured in that report. So before we um, dive into that conversation, just want to share a couple of quick um, reminders. So you can um, use the chat box today to share your thoughts throughout the webinar. And if you haven't already, like I said, go ahead and say hello in the chat and tell us where you're joining from. Um, I'm seeing people joining us from all across the country, lots of New York, New Jersey, some California folks joining. So welcome all. Thank you for being here. Um, I'll also note that we have time for Q&A with our speakers today. So as you're watching, if you have any questions, please go ahead and submit those through the Q&A box um, that you see in the toolbar on your Zoom screen, and we'll go through those um, during the Q&A section. Uh, and finally, we'll be recording today's event, so I'll share that out with everyone over email later this week. So um, if you, uh, many of you here today are members of Food and Water Watch. And so you know um, that we work to mobilize people and communities to build political power so that we can fight for the solutions that we need to protect our climate, our food and our water. And that's exactly what we'll hear about um, today from our speakers is how through this people power, their communities were able to stand up and fight the power plants in their neighborhoods. Um, and it's really your support as members that allows our organizers to work in communities across the country and our staff to work at the national level to fight for, um, to fight against the fossil fuel industry, to fight for bans against fracking, against factory farms, to keep our water clean and affordable and so many other things. So I just wanna thank you all, um, your membership and support makes this work possible and we're so appreciative um, of you for that. So as I mentioned, uh, we're gonna be talking today about some important fights that make a direct impact um, on the lives of people and communities living near these dangerous power plants. And overall are just another important step in protecting our climate. So if you are inspired by the work that you hear about today, um, please consider making a donation to Food and Water Watch. It allows us to keep up these important fights um, and through the end of this year, we have an exciting two to one match happening, which means um, any gift that you make will be tripled. So every gift between now and December 31st will be matched, which means your impact is tripled. So again, please consider making um, a gift today. And we'll put a link in the chat for you to do that. Or you can also text gift to the number 23321. Again, that's gift to 23321. Um, and as many of you here um, also probably know, this event is part of a monthly series. So each month we're bringing you discussions on um, pressing issues, current events, new research like today, or opportunities to hear from inspiring speakers. And today's event is part of our winter lineup, and the next one is in January. So we'll be starting off the new year talking about climate anxiety, um, what it is, signs for recognizing it, ways that we can address it on a larger scale, um, and then also some strategies for not letting it overwhelm us on a personal level so that we can all keep up this important fight in 2022 and beyond. And um, we're really excited to be joined for this event um, with, by a very special guest speaker, Dr. Lisa Van Susteren, who is a psychiatrist, an expert on the psychological effects of climate change, 
and she speaks frequently in the media on this issue and is really one of the first people to have coined the term climate anxiety um, and really bring it um, the attention that it deserves. So I think you'll all be really excited to hear from her in January, and I encourage you to um, sign up for that event um, through the link that we'll put in the chat if you aren't RSVP for it already. Um, so, all right, before we dive into um, the power plants research piece that will be um, the main focus of um, today's webinar, I first want to invite Jim Walsh, uh, my colleague and Food and Water Watch's senior energy policy analyst to our virtual stage here. Um, since this is our last event of 2021 and there is a lot going on in Congress right now regarding climate legislation, we wanted to share a quick update with everyone around the Build Back Better Act, other legislation, and what we should be keeping our eyes on um, in the new year. So Jim, thanks so much um, for joining us today for this. I'll, I'll turn it over to you for an update. Thank you so much, Kate. And before I start, I, I just want to echo something that you had said, Kate, and, and that is to really express my sincere gratitude to all of our supporters on this call. I, I honestly feel immensely privileged to have a career that allows me to, to work on issues that are important to me, important to our communities, and, and that wouldn't be possible with, without all of your support, and so, so thank you all very much. Now, with that being said, I want to level with folks, things are bad. Right? Global leaders are not taking the climate crisis seriously, and, and frankly, neither are many of the policymakers in the United States. I, I want to quickly share an image which highlights how far we are from where we need to be. And, and just incidentally, this image was actually shared uh, with me by, by one of our supporters recently. And so if you're listening and on today, thank you, Tracy, for bringing this powerful image to my attention. And we can see in this image that where we're heading right now in orange. And this is noticeably better than where we'd be if we were doing nothing, um, but is also nowhere near where we actually need to be. Even the pledges that global leaders are making are significantly short of where we need to be to hold uh, the, the planet to warming by no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the Biden administration you know, despite their promises to end oil and gas drilling on federal land has just conducted an oil and gas lease for 800 million acres in the Gulf of Mexico. The Biden Interior Department recently issued a report on how managing federal leasing and how to manage federal leasing going forward. And that report actually ignores climate impacts in their analysis and came up by ignoring them. They came up with the, the, the basic recommendation that we just need to tweak the royalty amounts on federal lands and do nothing to actually reduce um, or phase out drilling on, on federal lands. And, you know, well, this is a major shortcoming of the Biden administration, this isn't the only shortcoming of the administration as it pertains to climate. Um, we've actually been tracking the coziness of the administration uh, with the oil and gas industry at a micro site that we've created um, dealing with Biden's climate uh, cabinet. And so um, you can see the link in chat uh, to easily find that. But, and, and so the administration is, is largely not moving in the right direction, but Congress is also um, has major shortcomings. Um, they recently passed a bipartisan infrastructure bill, which was signed by President Biden, which includes billions of dollars to support infrastructure for the fossil fuel industry. And this is for scams like carbon capture, fossil fuel hydrogen, and, and there's also resources for building out a new segment of our economy based on converting captured CO2 from power plants into plastics, fuels and, and other consumer products. And, and all of this is being done under the guise of, of climate action. But in reality, these policies are, are designed to lock us into generations of new fossil fuel infrastructure. And they accomplish really nothing more than, than forwarding industry profits while, while warming the planet and all really under the guise of, of climate action. And this is very concerning and disappointing. The, the Build Back Better Act, which is um, moved past the house um, and awaiting action in the Senate has even more subsidies that have been tucked into it for the fossil fuel industry. They provide tax credits and rebates for producing CO2, hydrogen, this new stream of fossil fuel um, based fuels that they want to put out that the industry is actually calling advanced or low carbon fuels to make them sound better. But, um, you know, and I think one of the worst provisions in this bill that is very concerning to me is, is 
a, a provision that actually would increase subsidies that we already give to the oil and gas industry for oil drilling by subsidizing a practice that's called enhanced oil recovery. And this is where the oil and gas industry literally pumps CO2 into the earth as a way to squeeze out oil reserves. And this is, um, you know, really a, a, a ridiculous subsidy, but I think what, what makes it worse is the industry actually puts out press releases and statements claiming that this is a low carbon oil production, despite the fact this is actually results in a net increase in greenhouse gases. Now, things are, are definitely bad and concerning, and, and this does sound grim, but that, that is, there's also things that are positive that are happening and, and, and really significant things on the horizon that we're looking at. Um, one thing, the Build Back Better Act actually includes an end over $80 billion in international fossil fuel subsidies. And, and these fossil fuel subsidies are being taken out largely because of the efforts of uh, our, our allies and our, our supporters and our work um, to, to put pressure on the administration and Congress to repeal all the fossil fuel subsidies. Another really big thing to point to that's really exciting is just yesterday, Representative Schakowsky and Representative Barragon introduced um, this legislation called the Future Generation Protection Act. And this legislation will ban fracking, stop the export of fossil fuels, and stop the construction of new fossil fuel power plants. And this legislation was actually first introduced last session and only was able to garner the support of six members of Congress. When it was introduced yesterday, 22 members of Congress uh, joined in support of this legislation. And this is, this is because of the ongoing building and organizing and support that we've done to really have 22 members who came out strong in the beginning for this legislation, while we we're meeting resistance to taking this sort of position even two years ago uh, by many of these offices. And you know this legislation is not going to pass next year, but it does give us a really powerful tool to continue building support to end fossil fuel development in Congress with an eye towards the next Congress and making real progress as, as we move forward. You know, largely, nothing very big is, is likely to pass next year in Congress. That typically happens in election years. Um, they typically will campaign on the things that passed during the previous year, um, but don't want to take on these big overarching sometimes controversial pieces of legislation while members are running for, for office. But there is one piece of legislation that will be moving, and that's the appropriations bill. This is what funds the federal government. And we are working with our allies in Congress and other allies across the country to mount a challenge to the fossil fuel industry build out for this CCS, hydrogen and petrochemical build out that I had uh, talked about earlier. And the, the money has been allocated for Congress largely, but the administration doesn't have to spend it. And Congress has the ability to actually put more restrictions on this legislation. And there's gonna be regulatory processes where the Department of Energy and other federal agencies actually have to evaluate how they will spend this money and the standards they'll use to spend this money. And so by, we're, we're, you know, by mounting a regulatory approach as well as a approach in Congress, we can actually put um, uh, restrictions on how this funding is able to be used. And th this will be a very you know, uphill battle, um, but something that we need to fight. And, and also looking at the other places where there's opportunities is that this infrastructure doesn't necessarily have to be approved by federal agencies or state agencies. There's gonna be a lot of permits and regulatory hurdles that the industry has to jump through in order to build the thousands of miles of CO2 pipelines they're planning to build, the hundreds of facilities to capture CO2 in the atmosphere and, and produce fossil fuel hydrogen the industry is planning on, on building out. And so there's a lot of opportunities for us to mobilize and build on the ground to create a real strong constituency to push back against this effort and this new fossil fuel industry uh, build out. And so that image that we saw in the beginning, um, when we look at this image, it, it can look overwhelming and, and give you cause for despair. And, and I may attend the uh, climate anxiety briefing in January, and I'm glad to hear we're putting that together. Um, but I think the one thing that's important is to look at it and think about things moving forward and things have moved forward. Had we done nothing, the pink section would define where we are right now. 
But current policies and pledges are moving in this direction in a downward trajectory. And this is because of the organizing and pressure that we have put on, the, the, on, on elected officials and leaders around the country to actually take real meaningful action to, to, to stop the climate crisis from moving forward. And so while we still have further to go, and our current trajectory is not one that is sustainable with, for, for a society as we know it, and will cause tremendous amounts of suffering um, and, and harm to humans and our planet, we are in a position to actually continue bending that curve down to the pathways that we need to have. And so it's, it's up to all of us to continue fighting and continue moving things forward because there is nothing that happens in Congress because it's right. There's nothing that happens in legislative chambers because it's right. It's about building power and using that power to interact, to, to move forward policies that are gonna make a difference for all of us. And so thank you all very much for, for your time and, and for being here today. And thank you, Kate and, and all of our our speakers as well. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, that was such a great overview of everything that's going on right now and what we should be looking um, forward to um, in the coming year. So um, as Jim mentioned, um, stay tuned for more information from us in the coming weeks, especially around the Future Generations Protection Act um, and some of these um, budget appropriations that will be um, really ramping up in the new year. Um, and I'm seeing a couple people asking for the slide, the image that Jim shared. Um, and yes, we will share that out with everybody um, at the end so that you um, have access to it. Um, all right, so let's um, keep moving along. Um, so the, the next piece that we're going to move into here um, is really a discussion of our latest research report that we just published called Too Close for Comfort, the Power Plants Ravaging Neighborhoods Across the US. Um, and this is a really powerful report that puts the stories of communities at the forefront of these important fights against the fossil fuel, in uh, fossil fuel industry. Um, and as we all know, fossil fuels are destroying our climate and harming the health and safety, not only of communities near these facilities, but of everyone. And the fossil fuel industry, as you'll read in this report, often likes to refer to natural gas as a cleaner fossil fuel um, to generate more buy-in for it. Um, but as we know, natural gas is primarily produced from fracking, which is a dangerous form of drilling that contaminates our drinking water sources, pollutes our air and destroys the landscape. And that's why Food and Water Watch has been and will continue to keep fighting against the fossil fuel industry and against um, natural gas uh, existing and proposed power plants like the ones that we discuss in this report. Um, so in each of the three sections, you'll get to dive deeper into a specific community's fight. Um, and we'll hear from two of those communities today. So we have Mark um, Sanchez Potter joining us from New York, along with Emily Skydell. Um, and then we'll also hear um, from Tomas um, about our California work. And then finally, the last section of the report um, dives into um, a story in New Jersey. Um, so that you can learn about um, the work that they've been doing there to fight a series of proposed power plants. Um, and we'll put a link in the chat so that you can access the report um, and read it at your leisure um, after this webinar. Um, but for now, I will go ahead and bring um, Mark and Emily um, on with us. Um, and Mark, as I mentioned, is from Newburgh, New York, and he has been working alongside Food and Water Watch for years to stop the expansion of the Dance Camera Energy Center. And we're also joined by Emily Skydell, our Hudson Valley organizer. Um, and they both have been really leading this campaign. Um, and so I will turn it over to you, Emily, since I know that you've been working so closely with Mark over the years, and we'll let you take the conversation from here. Great. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, and welcome, Mark. So um, thanks for joining us here today. I, I just have a couple of questions for you. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> Yeah, of course. But first, um, yeah, before we get into some questions, just to give everyone a bit of a background on, on what Dance Scammer is and what this fight was all about, um, since we're talking to people right now from all over the country, so you may not have heard about this one. Um, so Dance Scammer is currently, um, it exists currently as a peaker plant. It's um, one, one of many across New York State which runs only during peak energy demand. So it runs when it's super hot out and people are um, blasting their air conditioning. So it's currently running just 5% of the year. And um, 
the proposal that was backed by um, a Wall Street private equity firm called Tiger Infrastructure. They put in a proposal a couple years back to replace the current Dan Scammer Peaker plant with a fully operational fracked gas power plant. This plant would run over 70% of the year um, and spew by Dan Scammer's own estimate over 4,000 more emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, it would be obviously piping in fracked gas from Pennsylvania. Um, this would have been bad for Newburgh residents. Um, it would have been bad for folks in Pennsylvania. Um, it would have been bad for folks all across the Hudson Valley at large who would be breathing the air and dealing with the impact of these emissions. So, um, and of course it also contributes to climate change. Um, I don't need to explain that um, to anyone here. Um, but you know, this win, it marks a huge moment for New York State. Um, it is, we, we just received about, um, it was in October now, um, about a month, a little, of, a little around two months ago, we found out um, that the Dan Scammer um, fracked gas power plant expansion proposal, they, were, they needed a Title V air permit and that permit was denied. So that meant that, the, that we won. Um, and the reason that, that they denied it was because um, of the impact it would have on um, uh, the emissions impact, um, the health impact, the, and that it doesn't comply with the climate law. Um, but, but really we know that, that the reason that it was denied um, had a lot to do with the, the, um, the immense political pressure um, that, that was mounted by um, folks like Mark and the grassroots campaign that Food and Water Watch um, was a part of and really built from the ground up. So, um, you know, we worked on the ground to empower and educate and mobilize community members to strategically fight back. And um, that's why we're here today to talk to Mark about this a little bit more. Um, and we wouldn't have been able to achieve this victory without him. So first, Mark, um, tell us a little bit about how you got involved, first got involved in Food and Water Watch and when you first connected with the organization. Uh, thank you, Emily, and thank you everyone for having me. So I first heard about um, the proposal to repower the Dan Scammer power plant in February of 2019. And my city council was actually trying to pass a resolution against it. And ultimately, uh, you know, in February of 2019, it got tabled because of um, a lot of confusion around what fracking meant and what this would mean for the city of Newburgh itself. Um, so afterwards, I started to attend events that Food and Water Watch was organizing within the Hudson Valley and within the city of Newburgh in particular. And in June of 2019, I joined a march to uh, our congressman's office asking him to formally oppose this power plant, um, which he did not uh, throughout the entire campaign. Uh, but I was connected with several organizers from Food and Water Watch, and they asked me to help them canvas and door knock and educate the community about this dangerous power plant. And I took it upon myself to work closely with Food and Water Watch. And I said, of course, I'm going to do this. And I love my community. And so then uh, when Emily came on in the beginning of 2020, uh, we really hit the ground running, uh, holding community meetings and uh, increasing the resolutions in the Hudson Valley against this. And ultimately, we did get a resolution against Dan Scammer uh, by the city of Newburgh City Council. And so ever since then, I've, you know, been going to protests, I've been organizing, pro organizing protests, uh, die-ins, pickets, calls to elected officials, bird dogging. Uh, I've learned about organizing from, from Food and Water Watch in general and about building people power. Great, great. Yeah, I think um, this, is a, this, this victory is a really great example of of, of the power people have over fossil fuels. We certainly don't have the money that the fossil fuel industry has, but we can certainly out-organize them, um, which we've proven here in the Hudson Valley. Um, so the proposed expansion to Dan Scammer was a clear example of why environmental justice needs to be at the core of our work. Um, 
can you tell us a little bit more about your community in particular, um, some of the historical environmental injustices that your community has been faced with, um, your drinking water? Um... Yeah, so the city of Newburgh is overwhelmingly a black and brown city. Um, and about five years ago, PFAS and PFOA were discovered in the drinking water uh, of the city of Newburgh. And so as a result of that, we had to switch to a different source of water and um, it caused a lot of, lot of confusion and a lot of uh, scared residents who didn't know what PFOS was and its harmful, um, harmful effects on the human body. Uh, coupled with, we have had historically a lot of lead pipes in our city. Uh, so we have had children that have been exposed to lead um, and who've had to live with these in these old buildings, uh, as well as, you know, there have been a lot of fossil fuel refineries uh, along the Hudson River that are in close proximity uh, to the city of Newburgh. So historically, uh, large corporations have picked the Hudson Valley and the city of Newburgh in particular as a dumping ground. Um, and most of the time, the state of New York disregarded the city of Newburgh, uh, even though it's a beautiful city, it's historic, and it has wonderful people in it because it was predominantly black and brown. And so when we talk about environmental justice, we have to make sure that we are centering the voices of black, brown, indigenous, and women, because ultimately these are the folks who are harmed the most by the fossil fuel industry and by the racism of the fossil fuel industry and disregard for human life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, so tell us a little bit about like um, you sort of went into some of the different rallies and actions that we that we organized. Um, can you tell us a little more in detail about um, what it looked like for Food and Water Watch to really be boots on the ground and um, what? Yeah, like a little just elaborate a little bit more on that. Absolutely. So. There, were, there was a coalition uh, of different orgs and folks that were involved in, in trying to stop Dan Scammer. But the first large group, as well as the group that dedicated the most amount of time and people and resources was Food and Water Watch. And they sent organizers such as Emily and, and you know many more, as well as volunteers and recruited folks from the community to canvas you know, my neighbors, myself, elected officials within the city of Newburgh with petitions, with phone calls. Um, and we organized uh, rallies and die-ins close to the, the uh, headquarters of the plant, which was in the town of Newburgh, um, with, with uh, community members. And we made sure that they knew what this plant was, that it would pollute the air, pollute the water, um, and it would be detrimental to the public health. And I think that's what really is important is we, the members of the community, um, they're a working class community. They might not understand the jargon of climate science, but they understand asthma and they understand what contaminated water is. So whenever we would knock on a door and we would talk with folks, they would sign our petition immediately after we've explained it. And they would say, absolutely, I don't want this for my children. I don't want this for my community. Um, how can I help? Can I come to something? Can I call someone? And we would always tell them, well, you can call the governor. And we you know, had, had a number set up and we would flyer at you know, different events. Um, and when, before we got the resolution passed, we made it a point uh, to go to every city council meeting and keep bringing up Dan Scammer. And we would bring dozens and dozens of people. And so the city council had no choice um, because the political pressure was just so great that they had to take a stand and they had to formally, uh, you know, pass a resolution against this power plant. So it was really old school organizing, uh, grassroots organizing, and just, you know, boots on the ground, knocking doors, making phone calls that really got us this victory. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. And um, a lot of what the, the, the resolution that we're talking about, um, there was, there, we passed um, 28 total municipal resolutions across the Hudson Valley um, against 
against Dan Scammer, um, starting with the city of Newburgh, or start, starting with the city of Beacon across the river, and then the city of Newburgh, um, arguably without those two resolutions, we never would have won this campaign. Because what those resolutions did is they signaled to the media um, that you know they generated press attention, they signaled to the community and to the surrounding area that um, this is something that, that people are really putting political weight behind. Um, and there was certainly a lot of work being done by Dan Scammer to, um, to you know, buy off local politicians. And so um, everybody knew that that was happening, but um, until we passed these resolutions, people didn't know that, that there was real power on the grassroots side. Um, and that is what really, I think, helped build the coalition that ultimately um, we worked within and um, that meant more resources. We were able to bring more organizations in with even more power and more reach across the state. And so, um, but without that sort of initial, initial um, organizing and grassroots effort, um, we never could have gotten to where we were. So um, I just wanted to, to highlight how, how important that work was. Um, and I think, um, I think that now Kate is going to share some photos, which which I hope, um, which I hope gives you a, even a better picture of what this was all about. Um, and maybe as we're going through the pictures, Mark, what are some of the key moments or turning points from the campaign? I started to list some, and you've listed some, but what are some other ones? Um, any highs, any lows that you can think of? Uh, well, definitely the the biggest high before actually winning was this picture of the. Uh, oh, if you go back. <laughs> Uh, this was a kayak action where we actually paddled out to Dan Scammer because it's on the Hudson River and we had about 60 uh, kayakers as well as two large uh, sloops um, from different environmental groups that came out. And um, we had a lot of press hits and we had, you know, a lot of community members that were supporting us. So, you know, it, it really was a, a great day on the Hudson River for that. And um, some of these are our ongoing pickets that we had in front of uh, in front of the dance scammer headquarters, and as you can tell, it was a multi-racial, multi-generational um, group of folks that really would come out to these events uh, and who cared deeply about it. These were mothers, these were grandmothers, these were young adults, children, um, and you know people of color who who said we care about our earth and we care about our health and we will not allow the fossil fuel industry uh, to trample over us basically. So those were some of the, and of this one we were uh, at the state of the state address in 2020. And after this picture, there might be one of a die-in uh, potentially. Uh, and of course this was after a community canvas and community meeting. Um, but the governor of the state of New York, um, definitely got very tired of seeing us showing up at, at a lot of events, um, as well as, you know, countless other elected officials bird dogging them um, uh, and members of Congress. So, you know, when they started to really see that there was that uh, political power um, and that political pressure, that was ultimately when we began to see a marked change in the narrative that people power can definitely win. And of course, you know, some of the lows that we experienced were the just the blatant lies that Dan Scammer and Tiger Infrastructure were selling to the public um, and trying to, you know, pit organized labor against environmentalists, which is not the case. Um, but they wanted to cause as much confusion as possible so that they could stall the clock and, you know, potentially get approval of this project. Uh, so we, you know, we definitely showed that when people are united and come together, we, we can, you know, truly move mountains. Yeah, yeah. And ultimately, um, you know, our current governor is experiencing a primary and we started showing up to all of the fundraisers she was holding and uh, different canvassing events with signs. And um, we knew that she knew that we were organized. She didn't, she knew she wanted to win over the climate vote. Um, 
So we also think that had an impact as well. Um, and so thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Mark. Um, and I will pass it back to Kate because I think we were running a little, little over time. Um, and I see that David Vassar's in the chat too, who was at the kayak of this event. So hey, David. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Emily and Mark. Um, it's so great to hear about all of the strategies and tactics um, that really went into this, as Emily mentioned, precedent setting um, win. And we will have some time um, for Q&A with the audience. So if you've thought of any questions as you listen to Mark and Emily, please go ahead and drop those in the Q&A box now. Um, and we'll try to get through a couple of those before we close out today. Um, and so now I'm going to turn things over to Tomas Rebecki from our California team um, to give us an update on some of the work that's being done in California um, and a little more insight into um, what's featured in this new research report. So welcome, Tomas. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, y'all. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. And I think a, a lot of these fights, we're going to find out uh, the tactics and what we did are the same uh, to really build power and use our grassroots action and movement to, to get our wins and, and protect our communities. So I'm gonna share my screen right now. I have a presentation. One second. Perfect. Can everybody see that? Yes, we can see it. All right, great. So again, uh, my name is Tomas Morales Rebecki, and I worked with Food and Water Watch for over seven years here on the central coast of California. And today we're going to be talking about a huge uh, instrumental win that really helped the climate movement in our area to build and, and get more wins as we've gone along. So um, I, I live in Ventura, Cal uh, Ventura County, California. And we are one of the biggest oil drilling counties in the state of California. And uh, the city, the largest city in our county is Oxnard. And Oxnard is over 70% Latino. There is over 200,000 residents. Um, and we actually grow a third of California strawberries here. And as you know, California, we produce over 85% of the US's strawberries. So we have a huge agricultural industry, but also oil and gas. And as a result, we have a long history of environmental racism and injustice. And our state's uh, environmental tool, Cal EnviroScreen, actually rates our communities as some of the most highly polluted with air pollution, and pesticides, and, and other pollutions uh, more than any other communities throughout the state of California. So we also have three coastal power plants that use this seawater to cool down, and they're fracked gas power plants too. And uh, they emit a lot of pollution, but also it's very harmful for our marine life to the amounts of water and heat that they throw back into the ocean. And uh, on top of that, uh, we have over 3,000 active uh, and idle oil wells, too, that uh, pollute our communities, our air, and our water resources, too. So we have a long history of environmental injustice here. Um, and back in 2014, uh, NRG, one of the nation's biggest uh, power companies, it's a $9 billion company, wanted to build a fourth power plant. And that would have made Oxnard uh, have more power plants out of any other city here in California and continue that legacy of environmental racism. So many community groups, including Cause, which is uh, one of our uh, social justice, environmental justice allies here locally, really started the fight and, and brought in a lot of community groups to really stop this uh, fourth power plant on our coast. And um, like I said, we, we started by, by getting elected officials to support us. Uh, we got resolutions from local cities and we had all of our uh, council members, uh, uh, Congress people speaking out about this and youth, uh, youth volunteers, uh, especially at our rallies and at our hearings speaking out were really crit critical in, in elevating this issue and getting it um, getting support from our community. Also faith organizations, if you read our piece, uh, Kitty Merrill, one of our volunteers, one of my close friends too, was really big in organizing with this. And she's part of the Unitarian Universalist Church and her church groups were really helpful too in, in getting the, the word out. But we could only do so much uh, of, of getting this in front of people here in our local community. So at the same time, uh, we were fighting the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC here, 
and their offices are over seven hours away in San Francisco. And these are some pictures of a rally that we had in front of the Public Utilities Commission, urging the commissioners to deny this project and that it was just, just an environmental injustice to put any more power plants or any other pollution in our community. So uh, we are doing all the tactics we could to get it uh, before uh, decision makers and making the right choice, but we weren't getting uh, the, the action and the movement that we really wanted. So um, like I said, we had hearings where we'd show up to, but we started uh, to, to really in 2017, right after Sandy Rock, uh, after battling this for years and not really getting people, we didn't feel that the Public Utilities Commission was listening to us or we weren't getting movement, we decided to, to go even further and, and oops, sorry, <laughs> skipped ahead. <laughs> Uh, and we did a direct action at one of the hearings that they had here locally. We decided to interrupt the, the meeting and take over the podium and risk arrest and uh, to really tell the people, you're not listening. It doesn't matter. We had these communities, we had these hearings over and over again, and we just felt that they weren't hearing. So we really wanted to do something to uh, get statewide attention, but also really make them know that we are serious. So. Uh, this is a picture of one of the hearings that we took over and risked arrest and and did direct action and it was amazing we finally got statewide attention of it um it really uh it galvanized the issue and got us more attention and thankfully at the same time too um the california energy commission was starting to explore more alternatives um so really like this non-violent direct action the sustained pressure for years and uh resolutions and and support from our elected officials really brought us to a breaking point where the state had no other option but to look for alternatives. And surprise, surprise, when they dug a little harder after the pressure, they found out that we could stop this power plant and, and instead of building it, replacing it with battery storage from clean energy. So it was in, uh, yeah, the, the following year, we declared victory and the, they squashed the project of the fourth power plant. It was a huge victory. Um, for us, it was actually the largest battery storage project ever um, created in the, in the US at the time. And uh, it was, like I said, so many different people, so many different organizations, Seafrog, Cause, uh, uh, Sierra Club, we all joined together and united and really fought back. And in the end, uh, we, we have now, as of just this year, we finally opened up that brand new uh, battery storage. So it was, it was a beautiful fight and it, it took years. And like we said, it took that sustained organizing and people power and direct action to really get what we needed and really protect our community and our coastline here in, in Ventura County. So uh, this, this momentum though uh, also helped us because uh, like we said, we have oil projects, we have other projects that we've been fighting and the following year after this, we used the momentum from our coalition and the power that we built. We actually got the first oil project ever denied in the history of, of Ventura County. They're trying to drill uh, 20 new wells next to a, a community here in Oxnard. And with our partners at Seafrog and Cause, we, we canvassed again, mobilized the community, and we were able to deny that project, the first one in over 100 years, that oil field expansion. And on top of that, we've built on those, those victories too. We've we just last year we passed the nation's first setback, 2,500 feet over a half a mile setback for new oil wells from schools, homes, and businesses. So all this was created from these years of working in coalition, building up our relationships, uh, having active outreach, and and really and really asking for not just what what uh, was possible, what we what they thought was possible, but what we actually needed in our communities, and and creating those things and. Do, do passing big, big initiatives like the setbacks. And we also just recently closed a big loophole that allowed oil companies to, to drill uh, with their old permits from the 40s, 50s, and 60s and not follow any current environmental review. Unfortunately, the oil industry has been fighting back and they qualified a referendum to put that loophole on the ballot. So we're gonna have to re-win that victory uh, in June coming up in Ventura County. So we're really mobilizing to really close that big oil loophole once and for all. So we have protections from oil wells and from fracking in our neighborhoods. So it's, it's really takes, uh, it's thanks to all the support from all of you all 
that help support our work and the continued uh, support of volunteers and just so many of the amazing organizers and just cross pollination between all of our different states and staff of, of ideas and tactics that work. So uh, I'm proud <laughs> to, to say that my children too, um, my daughter is the one right here in this little picture <laughs> with the uh, little purple sweater. She was there for that victory. And now I, I, I can raise, uh, be proud to say that we were raising our, our children in a, in a healthier community that has a brighter future. And it's thanks to all the work from you all and, and from uh, the great work from Food and Water Watch and all of our allies. And I'll kick it back over to Kate. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Tomas. Um, I'll also have Mark and Emily rejoin us. Um, we have a couple of minutes here for some Q&A, and we've gotten lots of questions um, in the chat and in the Q&A box and a number that were submitted in advance as well. Um, so one of the first questions that I want to ask um, is for you, Emily um, and Mark, now that the dance camera permit has been denied, what's what's next um, for the New York team? What What is currently um, on the horizon um, for your team? Um, yeah, well, so a few things. Um, one, as, as we anticipated, dance cameras already applied for an appeal. Um, it's worth just saying it. Um, we're definitely gonna be asking people to speak at it but the odds of their appeal being successful are like slim to none. They're appealing to the same agency that denied their permit. It's not like a separate agency. Um, you know, the governor came out against this proposal and the um, another one in Astoria and Queens. So, um, you know, we'll definitely be directing people to speak at, at this appeals public hearing, but really we're, we're thinking about the future for, um, climate um, legislation in New York as we approach the legislative session, there's a couple of things on the horizon. One is passing a law that would um, that would put a moratorium on crypto mining. Um, uh, I always forget the term, um, but if there's a certain term connected to the crypto mining, something with work. Now my brain is mushing, but, but we are pushing for a bill to put a moratorium on a certain kind of crypto mining, which uses a ton of energy, um, and they're already starting to, um, they're already starting to um, attempt to turn uh, peaker plants in, across New York, old peaker plants, and buy them up and use them uh, and turn them into fracked gas facilities to uh, to power crypto mining. It's pretty insane, and it would be really, really bad for climate. Um, so we've got a bill that we're pushing on that. And then also um, a bill, the All Electric Buildings Act, which would allow for all new, make sure that all new buildings in New York are built, um, are all electric. And we just passed a New York City version of that one, or we're, we, we just got word that it's, it's going to pass So today. So that's really exciting. Um, so yeah, we're just gonna, you know, use the energy that we've, we've been building here in the Hudson Valley and, and put it towards um, real action. And, and we're also gonna be, um, we're gonna be going up to Albany on January 25th for a big climate can't wait mobilization. Um, that's the scoop, Mark, anything to add? Proof of work mining, David, just put in the chat. Thank you, David. <laughs> that was the term I was looking for. No, uh, just those are the bills that we're you know, fighting for and Trying to get local state senators and assemblymen to uh, co-sponsor. So that's what you know. I've been working on uh, along with Emily and uh, others in our coalition. Awesome, thank you, um, Tomas. We got two questions for you that are both related to the Public Utilities Commission. One is just generally how many people um, are part of that commission? And is there anything that you can tell us about um, the ballot initiative in California that's upcoming to elect new commissioners? Yeah, so that, that's the problem with the PUC. We, we see them as a captured agency. So they get appointed by the governor uh, and, then, and then approved by the, the state Senate. And uh, a lot of the people in, in these, positions that it's like a revolving door from like <laughs> the regulators are coming from the industry or they just they leave and they they give a cushy job with them so that's been a really big problem with the public utilities commission they're supposed to be regulating these big utilities 
but they're really just giving them whatever they want from like the natural gas, trying to shut down Aliso Canyon, that is one of our big fights here, to uh, stopping these gas-fired power plants too in environmental justice communities. So the having electing them would make it much more democratic and a, a better way to, to get people that aren't just disappointed, uh, especially because Governor Brown and, and previous governors have been very friendly to the oil and gas industry, despite our very green picture of California here. So uh, this, uh, we haven't really looked into it too much if it's gonna be viable or not, um, but we, we would welcome any, any, well, any reforms at the PUC to make sure that it's more accountable to the people and isn't captured by these big utilities, billion dollar, multi-billion dollar utilities that usually get whatever they want um, and what was the other part of that question? I'm sorry, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, it was just if you knew how many members are on it. Yes, yes. So, so there's five members and there's currently a, a new member that's just got appointed uh, and they need to get confirmed, but they're going to be on the Public Utilities Commission for, for the time being. Uh, sorry, that's my daughter, <laughs> Esperanza. She's home right now. Um, and we we, we are pushing to, to have a, an accountability hearing for this newest member and make sure that they're not carrying the water for PG&E and all these other big utilities too, just like previous commissioners that they'll do what they're meant to do and then they'll just leave just like the previous commissioner was really trying to do the whole PG&E because they're under a lot of scrutiny over wildfires. Uh, she just basically did her piece to make sure that all that went smoothly for PG&E and then she left and now we have a new member that uh, is on the PUC but needs to get confirmed. So we really want to uh, grill them in their confirmation hearing to make sure they're good on our issues and make sure our state senators actually just don't give them a free pass. That's great. Thank you. Um, we can take just a couple more questions here because we're coming up on time. Um, so I'll ask this one and I think really any of you um, could answer this one, but one of our guests today asks, you know, how can we overcome corporate deep pockets to the Republican Party who are almost always voting for handouts um, to fossil fuel companies? If anyone wants to, to take it away, Mark, great. Uh, elect climate leaders and uh, make sure that folks that are um, for a livable future and a livable world and who refuse money from uh, the fossil fuel industry um, run for office and make sure folks support them and you know nurture them and have their back when they when they run for Congress or state senate or governor um, and you know just hold elected officials that we have there accountable right now. Um, they're elected. They're you know they have to answer to you. They they shouldn't answer. If they do but they shouldn't answer to the oil and gas industry. So make sure they know, you know, who elected them. Yeah, and the, the question again was, was how, how can we fight back against the corporate spending or? Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. So, uh, one, one way too is definitely help support organizations like Food and Water Watch that are fighting. Cause as we see in these fights, like we're outspent all the time. Like, and my favorite saying is we can't beat them dollar for dollar but we can beat them door to door. And that's really what we do and engaging people. We don't take any corporate or government funding. So it's really uh, sustainers and people like you the small donations that can really help us continue this work and spread it and really fight back against uh, all that corporate money either to the Republicans or Democrats. And um, it was mentioned earlier too, um, if, if you wanna help, we have a, a match going on right now. So if, uh, one of the links, I think someone will share a link on how you can become a sustainer to really support this work for locally and nationally so we can keep people accountable. And you can also text GIF to 23321 uh, to, to get a link on that. And yeah, like, like Mark said, like we need people stepping up into these positions to really put, uh, put themselves out there and really fight back against, because they're always gonna have candidates or they're always gonna have abilities to buy these candidates. So it's really gonna be up to all of us to step up and really support each other. Amazing. Well, thank you, Tomas and Mark. Um, I think that's 
a perfect um, way um, to end this. Um, as you both have shared, um, all three of you have shared um, throughout, you know, these fights are often not quick. There's no, you know, fast forward button. Um, so they can often take months or years of dedication and organizing. But as we've seen, we can win um, thanks in part to people like Mark, people like all of you here today who are really supporting this work and making it possible. Um, so we're just so appreciative to all of you here who continue to support our work through your generous donations, who are continuing to volunteer, to stay engaged and support Food and Water Watch in so many ways. So, so thank you for that. Um, before I let you go, I wanna share a few additional ways that you can take action today to support this work. Um, and these are also linked in the research report in each of the sections, but I'll just call them out quickly here. So first, if you live in New York, um, you can tell your assembly member to co-sponsor um, a bill that would put a moratorium on cryptocurrency mining. And as Emily mentioned, this is one of the, the big pushes um, for, the New York, uh, for New York right now. So please, if you live in New York, take a look at that. Um, and for those of you in California, you can send a message to Governor Newsom, urging him to stop all new fracking and drilling permits. And so we'll put a link um, in the chat for that as well. And these are both emails that you can send um, either to your assembly member or to Governor Newsom and can customize um, if you see fit. Um, and then finally, I encourage everybody to read the full web piece online. There's one additional story from New Jersey that's featured in the report that we didn't have time for today, but you'll definitely want to read about it. Um, and there is also um, an interactive map um, in the report. You can see a screenshot of it here, but in the report itself, you can enter in your zip code and it will zoom in to your neighborhood, your area, and show you um, any current or proposed power plants in your area, just so you can be a little bit more informed about um, what's happening around you. So definitely check, um, check that out as well. So I will um, email everybody um, the recording for today's event in the next day or two, and I'll also include um, that great graphic um, that Jim shared at the beginning, as well as the links to these petitions that I just shared so that you can um, send those to your family and friends and ask them to do the same. Um, and the last thing I'll ask you to do before we close out is to take our event survey. Um, we do really value your feedback and it helps us shape um, the continuation of this series and everybody who fills out the survey um, will be entered into a drawing to win a Food and Water Watch bandana. Um, and those of you who are joining us from New York might recognize um, Santosh in the picture here um, modeling one of those. Um, so we'll drop that survey link in the chat too. Um, and then if you want to join us in January for our climate anxiety event, um, please go ahead and RSVP for that. It's on January 19th. And as I mentioned, we are really excited to be joined by Dr. Lisa Van Susteren, um, who is an expert on this topic. So that brings us um, to the conclusion for today. So again, I just wanna thank everyone so much um, for being here with us today. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Emily. Um, and to all of our viewers. Um, I wish you all a happy and healthy holiday season. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in the new year. So thank you and have a great rest of your afternoon.